that's uh, on their driver's license that they want to donate for organs, you know, you, got, you really have no choice, then, I guess. Anyway, so it's kind of macabre if you think about it, but here we are, we're handling all these people that are brain dead, but they're, we're, they're, we're keeping them alive so that we can harvest all their organs. And uh, in the old days, we used to harvest one heart, two kidneys, a liver, two lungs, uh, two corneas, two kidneys, you know, all the good stuff. Uh, livers, a liver. Uh, we can transplant pan pancreas now, but not back then. Transplant pancreas. It's too much acid in it. You cut the sucker out and it starts leaking. And it makes like that salt sulfur battery acid. Anyway. Particular activating system. I know that's taboo. I apologize. But that's the way it works. The cerebellum is uh, composed of tightly packed and folded neurons. The neurons in the cerebellum form an interesting fan shaped uh, structure that includes granule cells, Golgi cells, and Purkinje cells. Uh, what is important there is the fact that uh, they're fan shaped. Purkinje cells are contained in the middle layer of the neurons in the cerebellum. Purkinje cells are large, multipolar neurons shaped like fans with many dendritic spines. This allows you to adapt physically uh, to whatever ha is happening to you. Uh, these cells run from the surface of the cerebellum to the, the brain stem, and for that reason, uh, you can learn things very, very rapidly. You can learn new movements very, very rapidly if you have to. So let's say uh, you get on a roller coaster for the first time, or a new roller coaster you've never been on before. Uh, the thing kicks you uh, from left to right, from left to right, turns you upside down, uh, does all kinds of interesting things to you. Uh, well, the first time you ride it, of course, you have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, kind of makes you a little bit sick. Uh, your head gets whipped all over the place. You feel like you've got whiplash. The second time you do it, by golly, you're ready for all those twists and turns and curves, and the reason is because of the cerebellum. Your cerebellum has learned that if I'm going to get on that uh, uh, that roller coaster, then I then I will need to to brace here and lean right here, and uh, and your cerebellum remembers all that because it yeah. doesn't want to get hurt. Yeah. Okay. My, my wife took me on a over in Las Vegas, the New York New York roller coaster on top. Uh, I, I was just looking at it and she says, you want to try it? And, and, uh, oh, I'm good. <laughs> Somehow she leaded us right into the... <laughs> into the line, huh? Uh, <clears throat> I'd close my eyes the whole, like, 75% of the time. Well, closing your eyes is probably the wrong thing to do, <laughs> because if you ever write it again, you won't know exactly what's coming up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The intricacy of the Purkinje cells allows the cerebellum to control both fine and gross motor functions of the body, and this is one of the reasons why you will be able to ride that roller coaster unless you close your damn eyes <laughs> and don't learn anything from the first ride. Uh, the position of the cerebellum between the spinal cord and the uh, thalamic centers uh, that communicate with the motor complex allows it to control motor function, and so your cere cerebellum is primarily a motor function uh, area of your brain. Uh, if we look at all of the hominids that have been out there, Neanderthal man, for example, had a much larger brain than we have. Uh, however, the largest part of his brain, the part that is bigger than what we have, is his, was his cerebellum. And for that reason, people have speculated uh, fiction, you know, they've written fiction about how he could uh, communicate through telepathy because his cerebellum was so large. I'm not exactly sure if that makes any sense. Uh, but uh, evidently he had better motor control than we do. The cerebellum leads into the pons, uh, the first portion of the brain stem. The pons, pons actually means uh, bridge in French and Latin. Uh, pons. Uh, I used to live in uh, Zweibrücken. Zweibrücken means two bridges in German. Uh, the French call Zweibrücken du pont which means two bridges in French. Du means two, and pawn means bridge, as strange as that may seem. Okay, so the pons is uh, involved in motor control and sensory analysis. Uh, information from the ear first enters the, the brain in the uh, pons. 
Uh, that's why we can respond so rapidly. And this has to do with motor control and sensory analysis. That's one of the, one of the reasons why we can we can respond so rapidly to sounds if if we hear a sound. Uh, and of course, if your brain knows what that sound is, like like gunfire. I mean, if we hear gunfire, the first time you hear gunfire, you don't think anything. You, you're not exactly you think it's firecrackers. <laughs> Uh, but of course, if you if you actually hear the bullets whipping around you, then uh, the next time you hear gunfire, you get down real quick. Uh, the bottom of the brainstem is made up of the uh, medulla, the marrow, or the uh, medulla actually means marrow or middle. Uh, the medulla controls both the neck and the tongue muscles. Uh, medulla also contributes to the regulation of breathing and heart rate, and of course, it is the medulla that gets damaged uh, that can cause you to. Uh, to asphyxiate after your motorcycle accident. So you have to be very, very careful that we get you to a hospital as rapidly as possible and get you on life support. The main intellectual functions occur in the cerebral cortex. Uh, of course, cerebral cortex means the external layer. Uh, cerebral cortex, uh, the gray matter, of course, is uh, six layers thick and contains between 500, or 50 billion and 100 billion neurons, and that's where your intellectual functioning comes from. That's why you're going to remember what I'm talking about. You're going to remember these things because it's going into your cerebral cortex. The functions of the various regions of the cerebral cortex have been mapped and divided into 46 distinctive areas known in toto as Brodmann's areas. So there's 46 specific areas of your brain that they have mapped, known as Broadman's areas, and obviously Broadman's the guy that did it. The most uh, numerous neuron in the cerebral cortex is the pyramidal cell. So if you're learning select pieces of information, it will branch out. Uh, how complex can this potentially be? Well, it can be extremely complex, uh, depending on, on what, what you uh, concentrate on what you watch, what you uh, observe, what you read. Uh, this can be extremely extensive because you are tying uh, little pieces of information here to other pieces of information down the road. Okay. So it's like electricity just... And it just spreads out. So the information you're getting now, of course, this is, has to do with biology. You learned this stuff in biology, but you're, now you're connecting it to psychology what you're do, going to be doing in the future. And so the more you learn, they grow? The, it does grow, and it expands, and it ties into other areas. And dendrites, right? Dendrites, exactly. Pyramidal cell dendrites uh, reach to the surface of the cortex and also spread out horizontally. These neurons seem to be arranged in columns. So we have columns of information. And we have millions of columns of information. I'm really stupid with tractors, as I learn every time I try to fix one. <laughs> so my column for tractors is probably really tiny. It's this little bitty column, and like there's three things in it. However, I can drive a tra I can drive a tractor. I just did a couple days ago. <laughs> I rode my tractor all over, all around my my property. That was kind of fun. Uh, I didn't wreck it, uh, and uh, I, I was able to start it, uh, and it was, I was able to turn off the gasoline, which is kind of interesting. It's an old tractor, so, so instead of leaving the gasoline on like you do with every other vehicle in the whole wide world, you have to turn the gasoline off so that it doesn't drip into the oil, or drip into the crankcase, or drip into anything else. Evidently, I hadn't been doing that, but the tractor had been running for a number of years. Anyway, my, my, uh, my friend and my mechanic put it back together, chastised, shaking his finger the entire time. What's the, the column on, on, your, on your tractor uh, uh, area of your brain must be only three neurons big or something, you know, that kind of thing. And I have a brother that has told me exactly the same thing. <laughs> Which is tragic, I guess. Uh, many brain regions have distinctive geometric columnar uh, uh, patterns that seem to function as information processing units, and there are millions of these things. Or actually, there's about a million of them. Some columns begin at the surface and extend all the way to the white matter. 
The human cerebral cortex contains about a million cortical columns. Uh, so does that mean we can only learn a million things? No, that doesn't mean we can learn a million things. That means we can learn a million different things that, that of course, they'll branch out. So if we're talking about psychology, psychology also ties into history. It also it ties into everything. Uh, and because of that, our, our columns for, for uh, psychology may be very extensive since that's what we're studying. Uh, my column for medicine, you know, I, I studied medicine to some extent, or actually it's mostly practical knowledge, but uh, you know, all of this information, all, this, all these little pieces of information are, are, are being stuck together. Not, not like cattle grinds, but just all, you know how like cattle, like for example you said medical, does it automatically go to medical, like it's doors in that? Oh, well, it's, it's in that column, so that column, yeah. yeah, yeah, so. And then there's medical psychology, then it's like, it, everything you're learning about psychology gets into like a file? Right, it's a file, but it's, it's, it's a whole column of yeah. structures, but you may have, a psychology you may have a hundred thousand columns. You just never know. I'm, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> it is. So the reality is our brains can hold all the information we need. We can learn everything. We are smarter than the, the supercomputers because we have all, we have the capacity to, to, to maintain all this information. And we have it readily at our fingertips, to the extent that if you're driving down the road, did I almost get in an accident? No, I guess I didn't. I, I was okay this time. Uh, a lot of times when you're driving down the road, you know, some something stupid happens. Well, there was a um, a semi, and I was passing him, and he started drifting over into my lane. I mean, this kind of stuff happens from time to time. The road kind of kind of hooked a little bit, and he missed the hook, or he was. I don't know, he's leaning down, getting a cup of coffee or something. Who knows what was going on, but he started drifting over into my lane. Changing radio stations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> break him, break him. Uh, yeah, I was on a CB radio or something. Anyway, he started coming over, and I caught him out of the, my peripheral vision that, that his, that his uh, vehicle was coming over. And in order to, uh, to uh, make sure that that was, the exact, was exactly what happened, I, looked, I was looking at his front wheel. Now normally you don't look at the guy's front wheel, you just go ahead and pass him. Uh, I was in the, uh, my CX-5, which doesn't have as much pickup as my, my Miata, I would have just taken off like a rocket ship and gotten around the guy in nanoseconds, but my CX-5 didn't go that fast, so I, I was looking at his front wheel and I saw the thing was over the, over the line about this much, and of course I was, I had scooted over. As he had scooted over, I had scooted over. So I was on the other side of the yellow line, but I hadn't hit the rumble strip yet. I hadn't quite hit the rumble strip. And uh, as, as I saw him, of course, your instinct is, get out of the way, this truck's going to smash you. you know. But if you do that, you've got, where, where are you going to go? <laughs> where can you go? You've got a truck on one side, and you've got a You've got a guardrail on the other side, so I mean, you've got to think about this for a second. You got to know where you're going to go, and the only place I had to go was was forward as quickly as I possibly could. But I could also I had I had a little bit of of leeway on the on the left side, and uh, and I just took off, and, and eventually he well not eventually but you know he corrected fairly quickly. But instinctually, you want to get out of the way. You know, you want to jam the wheel somewhere. If you do that, you're dead. I would have slammed right into the guardrail. And then I would have bounced off the guardrail right back into the truck, right underneath his, his back wheels, which wouldn't have been fun at all. So, yeah, I mean, here, all of this stuff is in there. You, you've got to know what to do. Um, I can remember uh, when, I was, when I was very young and people were drag racing that one of my friends I uh, was dragging down the road, and uh, he popped off. He popped off the side, the side of the road. I mean, it was only a two-lane highway. It wasn't even a highway. It was a, it was a farm road. So he had popped off one side. So what do you do when you pop off one side? Well, what you what what you what you think you you need to do is pop back on, but you can't pop back on because if you turn it too much, then you go to the other side of the road. 
<laughs> and that's exactly what he did. <laughs> so he was young, he was like 18 or 19 years old, popped back on the highway, he was dragging some other guy and he was going about the same speed, he was a little bit behind him, so when he popped back on, he clipped the, other, the back end of the other guy's car, they were going 90, 100 miles an hour, uh, clipped the other guy's car, the other guy flipped around, he flipped over, and this guy ended up on top of the, uh, at, this, at that time they had uh, electric, the, the electric lines were, uh, were above ground, and they were elevated, and he popped up so high that he landed on top of them. Uh, hooked him. Well, of course it did. One of, the, one of the wires was still hot, and he was inside the car, and of course the wheels weren't touching the ground anymore, the wheels had been touching the ground, he would have been grounded. But since he was upside down, he, he died. The other guy died too. Went into a ditch. <clears throat> at 19. At 19, yeah. Yeah, both of them. Died at well, the other guy was 22 or something. Anyway. Uh, little, 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 okay, so what are we doing? Uh, so we've got these columnar uh, uh, structures. Um, they, uh, they begin at the surface and extend all the way to the white matter. The human cerebral cortex contains about a million of these things. Most cerebral communication runs vertically up and down. Uh, so when we think about medicine, we think about all the medical things. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's an up or down situation. We don't start thinking about flowers. We don't start thinking about, I don't know, bees. We, we think of, of medicine. Uh, and, and of course, there is some horizontal communication, but uh, not very much, uh, which makes it make, which makes us less creative. If we could, well, it makes us also kind of goofy because we'd be thinking, you know, we'd be talking about history, and all of a sudden we'd break into song or something like a, some kind of an odd musical or something. The col uh, cortical columns in the neocortex are arranged in six distinct layers. However, most communication is vertical and the select neurons will extend through several layers, some through all six layers. And as you can see, they're very uh, structured. They're very patterned. So it's, it's a very uh, intense pattern. It's, 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 uh, there is no disruption here. It's all the same, unless you've got schizophrenia. And this is one of the reasons, if you've ever talked to a schizophrenic, you can't, you, they can't they're stay on pets. The they're just all over the place. And it's because these co columns are not, uh, are not structured properly. And we'll talk about that later. But it's really kind of fascinating how this works. And so there's six layers. It has six layers? I'm sorry? It has six layers. Yeah, and, and there are some neurons that, that will run all the way through all six layers. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes you can think of things very, very rapidly, and other times, you know, it has to bounce through all six layers before, like Pachinko. You guys have never played Pachinko. <laughs> Pachinko is a Japanese game. They've got, they'll, they'll, they have all these ball bearings, and uh, they, they've got pins, so it will, it will hit these pins, it will bounce over all over the place. And you're trying to you're trying to load all of these ball bearings into into a, a certain area down here. So at, at certain points, you can punch certain pins to move them over to to uh, you know, guide these these ball bearings down into the right hopper. It's the goofiest game in the world. The Japanese will play it for hours. Mm -hmm. And they have really no control over anything. So we went into a pachinko parlor, Kevin, my wife and I, and we decided that we would play. And, and we, were, we were done in about 20 seconds. I mean, they just all went the wrong way, and it was over with. We just wasted 20 yen a piece or something. And the people sitting beside us were just laughing at us because we're so stupid. But, uh, and here they are, they're guiding all this stuff through. It's really kind of, kind of sad. Not too sad. We left fairly quickly. <laughs> we were thinking, this is an entertainment. I don't understand. Why are there so many cars here? What's going on? We had to wait for like 10 minutes before there was a place to sit down at the pachinko parlor because all these people were playing pachinko. I guess it's like a video game. I know. 
It's the dumbest thing in the world. Only the Japanese. The sides of the bony skull, the brain is protected by three protective sheets called meninges. Meninges is, uh, is Latin for membrane. You've probably heard of meningitis. Meningitis is where you, one of these membranes becomes infected. Usually it's the dura matter that gets infected, or the pia matter. If it's a pia matter, you die fa fairly quickly. Very, very dangerous. Dangerous. Uh, your brain needs to be protected at all times. So if bacteria gets uh, into the uh, meninges, now we've got a really serious problem. The, the probability of brain damage is, very, is extremely high. Uh, the, the probability of death is, is actually fairly high as well. So this is extremely dangerous, meningitis. The outer layer is a tough envelope of cells called the dura mater. Dura means hard, and mater means matter, mother. Course, so it's the hard mother that protects, that protects the brain. The middle layer uh, maintains an open portion known as the arachnoid uh, through which uh, flows the cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that protects the brain. It's, it is like a shock absorber. It also feeds the brain. So the CSF is extremely important. Now, the arachnoid process is, uh, keeps it flowing through that area. Uh, you, have, uh, you have cerebrospinal fluid flowing throughout the central nervous system. So you've got it in your, uh, in your spinal column, you've got it in your brain. And if you don't have enough CSF, now we've got a really serious problem. A really serious problem because there's no shock absorber. So you can, if you twist your head too hard, your brain's going to go slamming up against your skull and it's going to you're going to do damage to yourself. But normally, you know, you, you're on that roller coaster with your damn eyes closed. Okay, so you, the fact that you didn't injure yourself is because of your cerebral spinal fluid. You had no idea what was coming up next since you had your eyes closed. Okay. <laughs> but you didn't come, come off the roller coaster with brain damage, I'm, I'm assuming. No. Not, not a whole lot. Uh-uh. Okay. So is there a certain amount in your brain that's... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there is the perfect amount. Okay. Well, does it just stay that perfect, or you, does it? Yes, unless you're, you've got problems. Okay. Some babies are born with. Um, have you ever, have you ever heard the term waterhead? Yeah. A baby that's, yeah, that's hydrocephalic. Uh, a baby that is hydrocephalic has, has a problem in their uh, spinal column or in their brain. Uh, and it has created a situation where the body's producing too much CSF. So the first thing that we have to do when a baby who is hydrocephalic is born, see that the more fluid that's in there, the more damage it does to the brain. So the first thing that we have to do as soon as that baby is born is to start draining off some of that CSF. So they'll put a, a stint in their head to drain off the excess amount of fluid. I know I have a nephew that that's what happened. They notice his head was getting bigger. Right. Yeah, they can. So they have to put a, a shink, is it a shink, with his head to drain? Yeah. yeah. And this usually is, it's a genetic mutation. Mm -hmm. It can be a problem. Uh, spina bifida is where the uh, spinal column is actually open at the bottom. Usually it's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It can cause the individual to be, uh, uh, to be a quad, not a quadriplegic, but a paraplegic. So their legs don't work because that, yeah. that portion of their spinal column doesn't work. Mm -hmm. He kind of walks like um, in one half, like, kind of like his his knee kind of go. Do, does he have a hole in his in his? If you look at his backside, does he have a hole back here, where his coccyx coccyxes? I don't know. I know. Right, right above the crack of his butt. I don't know. Okay. I, <laughs> Didn't I look at that part of his. Butt. Well, I, you know, this, these are problems that potentially people can, can have. And we can tell if they have spina bifida uh, by drawing a blood test called the alpha feta protein. Uh, if they have too much CSF, if, they have, uh, if they're hydrocephalic or if they have spina bifida, uh, then the uh, alpha feta protein will be high. Um, if they have Down syndrome, then their alpha-feta protein will be low. 
So what we will do at, I don't know, the, I think it's the three month mark, at the, at the end of the first trimester, we will draw an alpha feta protein to find out if they have drop down syndrome or if they have uh, some kind of brain damage due to some kind of odd structure taking place. So we can tell that actually. And at that juncture, if the alpha feta protein is high or low, a lot of women will, ab will abort their fetuses because the baby, either the baby's going to die in utero. Trisomy, tri trisomy, trisomy, it was a charge. Yeah. 21. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we can tell all these things. And so some women will abort their fetuses. And some, some of course, will go ahead and, and give birth to a, a child that is has all kinds of interesting spinal problems. A lot of times there's uh, uh, intellectual degeneration at the same time because of the brain damage. Uh, Down syndrome, of course, we all know about Down syndrome. Sometimes it's severe, uh, sometimes it's not, not so severe, you know. And they, they just have to make the decision as to what's going to happen next. So if somebody has meningitis, or you think that they have meningitis, one of the things that you can do is you can draw a uh, cerebrospinal fluid out of the spinal column. Yeah. And that works. And then we look at it to see if there's any bacteria in there. There shouldn't be any bacteria at all. Uh, we look to see what the type of bacteria it is. Uh, we, we check to see if there's any white cells in there. There shouldn't be any white cells. There shouldn't be any red cells in there. They may be bleeding into their, into their brain, so this is a really serious problem. Uh, so when in, an individual has a concussion, if it's a severe concussion, uh, then we, will, we may draw their, a cerebrospinal fluid in order to determine if they have uh, uh, blood leaking into their brain, leaking into their meninges. The problem with that is that if, like, <laughs> like you said, there's a perfect amount. And almost everybody has a perfect amount. The three of us have the perfect amount of cerebrospinal fluid. We never get headaches. We never have this problem or that problem. One thing doesn't have anything to do with the other. I got it. One thing doesn't have anything to do with the other, so we're okay. But if we had a concussion, you know, we were in an automobile accident or you bumped heads with a football player and he had a helmet on, um, then potentially you'd, you'd have a concussion and you'd be leaking red cells into your CSF. Now this is only in severe cases. Normally that's not what happens. A concussion is just a bruising of the brain of sorts. And then it just needs to, to repair itself. The reason that uh, brains don't repair very rapidly is because it's such a protected area. And uh, the, the, uh, we have evolved protecting our brains uh, extensively. I mean, so if we get a blow to the head, it may take months for that to recover. And of course, if you if you watch the um, uh, football or, or you've watched baseball, if somebody gets hit in the head, sometimes they'll be out for you know, a week, a month, you know, six weeks, the whole season. They'll lose the the whole season to a concussion. That happened with a baseball player that uh, played for the Giants. He was a, their first baseman. He got drilled in the head, and uh, and and. Uh, from the pitch, and he was out the rest of the season. Double vision, you know, all kinds of interesting problems. Anyway, CSF. <laughs> the brain is not a solid mass. There are four open areas called ventricles. Ventricles one and two are, are lateral ventricles in each hemisphere. Uh, ventricle three is between the hemispheres uh, below one and two, and then ventricle four is in front of the cerebellum. And here's the cerebellum. This is ventricle four down here. So as you can see, there's a lot of open areas. Now the interesting thing is that we can look at those open areas and we can tell if you've got a problem. One of the things we can tell is whether you've had lots of concussions. One of the things that will happen to you if you get hit a lot, if you're a football player or you're a boxer, one of the things that will happen is those ventricles will get larger and larger and larger. Uh, if you have schizophrenia, because your brain isn't uh, functioning properly, those ventricles will get larger and larger and larger. Are they like gappy, like just real gappy, like Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease, yeah. Parkinson's disease, we see exactly the same thing. Schizophrenia, we see exactly the same thing. Huntington's disease, we see the same thing. 
they have stopped, uh, their intellectual functioning has uh, deteriorated, and because of that, the, the middle of the brain, all these open areas start hollowing out, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Like gappy, yeah. Right. They did. Uh, they uh, did a brain scan of when they first started. Uh, when they were first able to do this, they did a brain scan of uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, and he had Parkinson's. At that point, he had Parkinson's disease. But he'd been a boxer, and in the beginning of his boxing career, nobody ever touched him. Uh, he never got hit in the head. But then, as uh, as he got older and he got slower. He couldn't protect his head as much, and he got blasted a, a bunch of times. And of course, it developed into Parkinson's disease. But uh, they took a, 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 a CAT scan of his head, and they found that these ventricles were just massive. They were huge. So this is what we see in football players. This is what we see in boxers. This is what we see in, in soccer players who do a lot of uh, head balls, because a head ball is coming in. At, I mean, the soccer ball is coming in at. Uh, at a very rapid speed of maybe, you know, 75, 100 miles an hour. And he's deflecting it off of his head. Uh, he's actually moving his head. And so when that happens, of course, the brain just ricochets inside his, uh, inside his skull uh, in order for him to score that goal, which is the most important thing in the whole wide world. So we have soccer players that have this problem. We have boxers. We have football players. So. We are asking ourselves whether it's worth it or not at this stage. I'm hoping my grandson doesn't play football. But he wants to play football, and he's going to play flag football this fall. Oh, my son played football, too, so I used to just be like, oh, you know, he used to be basketball. I don't know how he diverted to, um, to uh, football. And I thought, you know, but we wanted him to be in sports or in something that we, he just had an interest in. That. It's a game. It's another game. CSF, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, is produced in the uh, choroid plexus. It's a portion of the lining of the ventricles. Of course, the ventricles are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and that's where it's made, actually, in the, uh, in the open area along the, the side. CSF is basically plasma. It's, uh, it is the fluid portion of your blood with the, uh, with the red cells and white cells taken out. Uh, I've been in on a lot of the uh, of drawings of CSF, uh, and it's clear. It's completely clear. It looks like water. It's salty, though. Don't, take, don't drink it. Okay, it's real salty. <laughs> the functions of the CSF include uh, it's a shock absorber for, uh, absorber for the brain. It also collects nutrients and blood, uh, from blood vessels and passes them onto the brain surface. And of course, this is all very, very important. So the CSF is extremely important. Uh, if you have a depletion of CSF, if we draw a, uh, a, a CSF specimen from your spinal column, uh, you will have a, uh, your, your body will have to correct it. Uh, and you'll have a headache until, until they, uh, the, uh, the body uh, corrects it. And it'll take four or five hours for that to, uh, to correct itself. So normally after we draw a specimen from somebody, they have to lay down, stay down for about, uh, for about four hours. Okay, let's talk about slitting somebody's throat. Blood is supplied to the brain through two significant arteries that run on each side of the esophagus. Uh, the carotids, uh, carotid is an interesting word. It means plunge into sleep, and they're known as the carotid arteries. And you've got one on each side of your esophagus. You can pinch the sucker off, and you can pat make yourself pass out. <laughs> I don't know why you do that. <laughs> uh, but you can do that. And of course, it's protected by the esophagus. The esophagus is, is uh, cartilage. It's relatively bony, so it's not, this is supposed to protect you. Uh, what movie was it that they snatched out the guy's esophagus? Oh, it was uh, Roadhouse. Uh, Patrick Swayze, <laughs> he snatched out the guy's, the guy's throat. How did it throw a chop? Yeah, well, no, he, he hooked his fingers like this and he grabbed it off on the other side. He just pulled his, his uh, throat up. The vertebral, uh, I don't know if you can actually do that or not. Uh, the vertebral arteries bracket the spinal cord and they enter at the base of the skull. Uh, so your, your uh, blood flow is protected by one by the, by the bony vertebra in the back 
and, and then by the bony esophagus in the front. And right, it's right on the side, right, right beside it is your carotid and your uh, vertebral arteries. And there you go. You, it's, it's a duplicating system, so even if your, your carotid arteries uh, are blocked, and there are people with partially blocked carotid arteries, you're still getting blood to the brain through your, your vertebral arteries. So you ask yourself, well, if you've got a backup arteries in the back, why do you, why do you die if you get your carotid artery cut? And the answer is you bleed to death. You bleed out. It's like what a main vein or something. I'm sorry? Is it a main bloodstream? Yeah. Yeah, it's going, all going up into the brain, and then it's filtering back down uh, through the uh, uh, venal structure. Carotid? Carotid. Yeah, this carotid. is the carotid goes is beside your esophagus. Then you've got vertebral uh, arteries in the, uh, around your vertebra. Mm -hmm. And that's what they look like. Here's, the, here's how they, they come back down into the... Uh, back down into the circular, circulatory system. This is what it looks like. This is a, a I can't think of the word. There's a, there's a exhibit in Las Vegas, it's called Bodies. It's kind of to show all these um, exhibits um, on uh, every section of like, everything in the body. It's interesting. I saw it on YouTube, uh, even like, like little fetuses, the more they were growing, uh, all the veins, the hearts, the lungs. A healthy lung, a, a bad lung. What an odd so, place for. Yeah. <laughs> for the, I mean, you go to Las Vegas to, to study anatomy, of course. Yeah. yeah. Not. It's usually <laughs> living and moving. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Look at it on YouTube. Oh. I, I wanted to go see the exhibit, but I don't think I want. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. Is that would that be taboo? Well, yes. none of none of its <laughs> actual living tissue or had, had been living tissue. So I had to ask about that. So it's, it's probably mostly mock-up, I would guess. Okay. At the base of the brain, the carotid and basal uh, arteries join to form a structure called the circle of Willis, and that is right here. Uh, you can't get to it. Uh, it's not like you can slit somebody's throat and cut the circle of Willis out. That's just not going to work. It's too deep into the into the brain. I guess if you decapitate somebody, you can cut off the circle of Willis. The merging of these two cerebral arteries provides a backup in case blood flow is impinged in one of the, the two major arteries. Uh, so there are backups, of course. Um, I had a friend that, uh, <laughs> and I have no idea why, he, well, he was a rodeo rider and he was a bull rider. So that may have had something to do with something. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, poor old, uh, poor old John R. He uh, he had one of his carotid arteries was starting to block, and he was starting to get dizzy. But he was only getting dizzy on one side. It was really the oddest thing in the world. So he went in to see the doctor, and the doctor said, "I think you know, if you guys aren't old enough yet, but when you get older, they'll start putting their stethoscope up against your carotid artery to listen to it, to see if it's impinged." in any way, so they'll put it on both sides and listen to it. But they only do it to old farts, mm -hmm. like me and John R. Anyway, they found out that John R., well, half of John R.'s carotid artery was impinged, so they had to go in there and ream it out and clean it out. So how did they get blocked? Uh, in his case, it was probably the really strange food that he had been eating. He was a cowboy, so he had eaten, you know, back bacon and all that other horrible stuff that cowboys eat. And beans, uh, ad nauseum. I don't know. You know, a lot of a lot of meat, a lot of fatty meat. Sure. Well, they got the best cuts of the cow. You know, they butcher a cow, and they'd all get T-bone steaks. You know, it's got lots and lots of fat in it. Anyway, he, that was his problem. Uh, he lived, and he's still alive. He's having circulatory problems in his legs now. Last time I talked to him. <clears throat> Uh, despite the rich tissue of the brain and the, of the myriad of viruses and bacteria seeking entry, infections uh, in the organ rarely occur. You hardly ever get uh, have a problem with your uh, with your brain, uh, and that's because the capillaries in the brain are much smaller than the capillaries in other parts of the body. So, so bacteria can't get in. 
Your brain is protected, is especially protected because it's such rich food. Uh, any bacteria would want to infect your brain. And any bacteria that gets into your brain is it becomes an infection. This is really, really serious because we got all kinds of interesting bacteria all over our bodies. And normally they're, they, uh, they don't cause any problems. They don't cause infections. They're not Staph aureus. Staph aureus, of course, is, uh, will always cause an infection. They destroy group A, always causes an infection. Klebsiella, E. coli, we've got all these bacteria that can potentially destroy us, but they, they can't get into your brain. They're just too large. A uh, little uh, substances in, in the blood will rarely pass into the brain, and this is called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so even if you're taking your medication, some of the medications won't get into your brain. It's just their molecules are just too large, so they can't make it. An angiogram, a vessel picture, is an x-ray of the blood vessels. If a stroke is suspected, an individual can be injected with a dye, and the skull can be x-rayed to show possible hemorrhages aneurysms or occlusions. Uh, occlusions are blood clots. Uh, aneurysms is where the blood vessel actually loses its uh, or, or becomes too elastic and it will balloon out. And hemorrhages are of course breaks in the blood vessel. This is usually the first test performed if a patient is suspected of having a stroke. 85% of all uh, of all <laughs> 85% of all strokes are caused by blood clots. And we have a medication that will dissolve that blood clot. Now remember, all the blood vessels in the brain are pretty small, pretty tiny. So all we need to do is dissolve that blood clot. So it's a, it's a substance known as TPA. So if somebody has a stroke, and you give them a shot of TPA, and it's a blood clot, you just save their life. And you probably save their brain. However, about 10% of the time, the problem is a hemorrhage. And if you give them TPA, it will make that hemorrhage worse. So you can't automatically give somebody TPA if they have a today had a stroke. Otherwise, you may kill them. So when I had my heart attack, uh, they knew they were going to have to fly me to another city in order to have my uh, operation. So the doctor said, well, we don't have time to do a, a, an angiogram, but you could potentially have a stroke. And what I, what I want to do is give you TPA to keep you from stroking out. That thins out the blood. Is yeah, it? oh, it, it well, dissolved it dissolves the clots. Okay. So uh, he said, well, you got a 10% chance of, of dying on the airplane. <laughs> well, you got to, actually, the, the probability of dying on the airplane was a lot higher than that. But he was talking about the hemorrhages and the occlusions. And of course, my wife was going, oh my god, I don't know what to do. And so uh, what we actually did, I, I got the TPA shot, just in case. Because he wanted to give me morphine to take the pain away. But morphine doesn't work on me. It doesn't take the pain away at all. Anyway, that's what happened. Uh, CAT scan is an x-ray of a thin sliver of tissue. If the patient is suspected of having a tumor or a stroke, a CAT scan uh, would allow a physician to visualize the affected area. And uh, what actually that you're visualizing, in this case, would be if it was a blood clot, of course, it would be a dead area of your brain. Uh, if it was a tumor, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a mass. Uh, and usually we, they can tell the difference between a mass and a hemorrhage or a dead spot in your brain. Necrotic tissue is what they call it. Uh, because uh, necrotic tissue, of course, isn't healthy, and since it's not healthy, it has a different look. This is actually a stroke, and this person has a, a blood clot uh, at some area in here, and it's killed this portion of his brain. Now you have to ask yourself, can you live with a dead portion of your brain? And of course you can. It sure happens all the time. You just don't use that part of your brain. Well, you've got the same part of your brain over here on the other side. The, both sides kind of duplicate each other, especially if you're female, since you have such a large corpus callosum. Um, would you lose? What would you lose? 
Well, you might lose memory, you might lose movement. Uh, since this is on the right side of the brain, uh, you'd have paralysis on the left side. Because it switches. Yeah, it switches. Exactly. If somebody, if you think somebody's had a stroke, uh, you can tell if they've had a stroke by telling them to stick their tongue out. If they can't stick their tongue out, they probably have a stroke. If they can't stick their tongue out, but it seems like it's, it's only on one side, then they've had a stroke, and it's, it's, and you can tell which side of the brain it's on. So that's that's how you tell if somebody's had a stroke. Tell them to stick their tongues up. Whereas the angiogram, the CAT scan, are both X-rays. The MRI, MRI uses radio waves and other magnetic energy to visualize the structures in the brain. MRI has to do with uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, and that's that's why it's 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 a magnet actually. Uh, small changes in structure as small as a myelin uh, on individual axons can be visualized. Uh, these uh, we have this is really improved. I can remember when they first invented the MRI and they started using it. Uh, it can't be anywhere close to the hospital, so it's usually in a, in a, a semi-trailer. Uh, it has to be away from the hospital because the magne magnetic aspect of the MRI will, will affect all the instruments in the, in the hospital. So it's usually in the parking lot, way out on the other side of the parking lot. <laughs> or sometimes they'll build a building that has the MRI machine in it. PET scans are machines that detect radioactive activity in the brain. The radioactivity comes from radioactive uh, impregnated glucose injected into the subject as the various areas of the brain metabolize uh, the glucose for their activities. Uh, the researcher is able to see which areas are active with select tasks. And as you can see, uh, the areas that are lighting up are the areas that uh, are utilizing the, the radioactive glucose and so they can visualize which areas those are. And that is the PET scan. They also have a uh, fMRI. The fMRI, F stands for functional MRI machine. Uh, it uses a very intense uh, magnetic signal. Uh, because the functional MRI is so powerful, it can detect minute differences in metabolism. Uh, this gives researchers a similar picture as the PET scan, uh, but without the radioactive injection. Uh, and in this one, of course, we're looking at a tumor uh, here. It's a little bit lower. This is the speech center. And as you can see, the, uh, the tumor is uh, eating into the speech center. And that's why the person has lost their ability to talk. And this has to do with, um, this is a guy that has had his right foot amputated. Uh, but that portion of the brain is still lighting up. And the reason it is is because he, he still feels it. He still feels his, his amputated limb, mm -hmm. as odd as that may seem. And that would affect probably, like, uh, would that affect like kids? Anything? Speech? Memory? Nothing? No, it would just affect... His motion? <laughs> like moving? Uh, potentially, but it, it, usually it's what they refer to as phantom pain. Uh, so it hurts, uh, or it tickles, or it, it's usually an ache, aching pain. Oh, and it signals to the brain. Yeah, the brain thinks that it's still there. And uh, it's the pain, the pain centers are, are firing, as odd as that may seem. Okay, now we're going to find out how the neuron works. They all work primarily the same, using the same uh, chemicals. Electrical signals are the vocabulary of the nervous system. Molecules that maintain electrical charge are called ions. <laughs> and as you can see, it moves from the dendrites all the way down to the axon, or all the way down the axon uh, to the axon terminals. And that's the direction that a, uh, a neuron fires. Neurons contain large complex proteins that maintain a negative uh, charge, but because the channels are closed, uh, to the larger positively charged sodium molecule, only the smaller positively charged potassium ion can pass through the small channels. Potassium ion is much smaller than the sodium ion. And for that reason, the sodium ion, uh, it's a negative charge, of course. I'm sorry, it's a positive charge. 
uh, sodium is a positive charge and potassium is a positive charge. And because of that, it maintains a, neuter, a, uh, a positive charge to some extent. Okay. Because the large negatively charged proteins, uh, in, because of the large uh, negatively charged proteins, a neuron at rest maintains a negative a resting potential of from negative 50 millivolts to negative 80 millivolts with an average of negative 70 millivolts. So it's negative on the inside. All right. And we have potassium moving in and out, and we have sodium that's trying to get in. Negative 70 millivolts is a potassium equilibrium potential as equated by the Nernst equation. There are many more potassium cations uh, inside the uh, cell than outside, while there are uh, more sodium cations outside than inside. So you have positive uh, 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 potassium on the inside, you have, you have positive uh, sodium on the outside. And remember, it's negative on the inside. Why is it negative? Because of chloride, chloride ions. And the chloride ions are negative. So it maintains a, an average of a negative 70 millivolts. Are you getting the picture? Sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside, and chloride on the inside, chloride making it negative. Okay. When the neuron is stimulated by a neurotransmitter detected by a dendrite, the chemical neurotransmitter be, uh, causes localized depolarization. In other words, the neurotransmitter causes the sodium channels to open in the immediate area. And when the sodium channel opens, of course, the sodium ions come flooding in, and it makes it a positive charge. Now remember, it started out as a negative 70. So now all of a sudden, the sodium channel opens but we got all of these positive sodium ions flooding in. What time is it? Nine o'clock? Is it nine o'clock? No, it's ten o'clock. It's ten o'clock. It's ten o'clock, so we have twenty minutes, right? No, 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 no. Stay here. Stay with us. I'll sit back here. Okay, that's fine. I don't want you to leave. You know, I might lose you for the rest of the day. That would be a tragedy. For a neuron to react, it must receive an adequate amount of neurotransmitter to stimulate enough sodium channels to open up. This is referred to as, as the neuron's threshold, usually a de depolarization of, a ne of negative 50 uh, millivolts. If the threshold is reached, then enough sodium channels will open to trigger the depolarization. So it's one of those... Uh, it's almost there, it's almost there, and as soon as it gets to negative, uh, negative 50, uh, then all of a sudden the uh, sodium channels open and, all, and the sodium comes flooding in. Now because po well, that part of the neuron is depolarized, it creates a chain reaction all the way down the, the axon. And now since this sodium channel opened, it's going to trigger the next uh, portion of the ac axon uh, to uh, depolarize and its sodium channels are going to open and it's just going to, it's going to be a, uh, a domino effect all the way down the axon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But it, the, the threshold is, is negative 50. It starts out, off, starts out at negative 70. And as soon as, as it gets to negative 50, then it just trips the whole thing. In. You get the domino effect all the way down the axon. Mm -hmm. A little, 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 okay. And, and of course, the reason that it, what it's actually tripping is it's opening up those sodium channels. A neuron cannot only partially fire, it either fires or it doesn't. This is known as the all or nothing property and all axons are this way. This is one of the problems with pain. Uh, you, you get a, a reaction. Uh, the pain uh, is not really that intense and then all of a sudden you've got some severe pain because your axons are, have started firing. It has tripped the, the, the threshold. It's an all or nothing thing, uh, principle. Now all of a sudden you've got pain. When the threshold is met, the sodium uh, ions flood into the portion of the cell through the rapidly opening uh, sodium channels. And because of that, you know, they've got all this sodium on the outside, they've got all this potassium on the inside. The, the potassium floods out, the sodium floods in, and now we've got a positive uh, reaction. It, now it, suddenly it's positive, whereas before it was negative because of all those negative chloride molecules. 
Uh, one of the reasons why we need salt so desperately is because sodium chloride, potassium chloride, they're both salts, right? So we need salt in order for our axons, in order for our neurons to fire properly. We need salt. We also need calcium, but we won't talk about that yet. Uh, this triggers the sodium channels next to the stimulated area to depolarize as well and it creates the chain reaction that I was talking about before. And uh, eventually it will make it all the way down to the synaptic cleft, depolarizing all the way down, this, this chain reaction situation. Action potential refers to the amount of positive ions that are allowed to flood into the stimulated area of the cell through the sodium channels before the sodium channels close. The action potential for most neurons is positive 40 millivolts. So it goes from negative 70 to positive 40. It's a change of 110 millivolts. All that sodium is, is, is flooding in. All that, all that chloride and, and potassium are flooding out. The sodium ion is much larger than the potassium ion. And that's one of the reasons why the potassium ion can cross back and forth. But the sodium ion this is a much larger molecule, and it can only go through the sodium channel. So all that makes sense? And when the sodium comes flooding in, since it's a larger molecule, it depolarizes things more rapidly, and it gets to the point of a positive 40 millivolts. So it goes from negative 70 to positive 40, a change of 110 millivolts. Going beyond equilibrium uh, with the outside environment, zero millivolts uh, is called the overshoot phase. And of course, that's the problem. So you, it's, it's like water. Uh, you've, you've got uh, water just hasn't quite made it yet, hasn't quite made it yet, and all of a sudden, a little bit of water leaks over, and you get a flood. And that's exactly what happens with the sodium. So it goes beyond where it should go. It should go to a, a point of equilibrium, zero millivolts, but it doesn't. It overshoots it, and it, it goes to a positive 40. Now we have to recover. So how in the world are we going to recover? I guess that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Well, the neuron is recovering from stimulation. It cannot be stimulated. It can only, I, I mean, it can only, <laughs> it can only uh, react uh, uh, to a certain extent. And as soon as it has reacted, it can't react again until it returns to back to normal. And this is known as a refractory phase, when it's trying to get back to normal. And the way it does that is by pumping all the sodium out and replacing it with potassium. During the refractory phase, the sodium channels have closed, shutting off the supply of sodium ions flooding into the neuron, and potassium channels open up. Now, potassium channels are, uh, the, so the potassium chloride is flooding back into the, the cell. Because the electrical charge outside the cell is more negative than inside the cell, the potassium ions are drawn out of the cell. So now it's, it's actually pulling potassium ions out and replacing them with chloride. With the positive potassium ions now flooding out of the cell, the cell quickly loses its positive charge and it not only reaches its resting phase potential, but it goes beyond it in a phase known as the undershoot phase. So now instead of being at uh, Negative, negative 70 millivolts, it's below that. The potassium leak channels now allow uh, enough sodium ions to re-enter the cell to return the area to its resting potential. And now we've got, now we're back to, to normal. Neuron dendrites and somas usually have a different type of membrane than axons. Dendrites and somas usually have sodium channels that are stimulated by chemicals and not by voltage. In other words, they, only are, they are only activated when the chemical neurotransmitter is present. The axon, on the other hand, does have voltage-gated uh, sodium channels, so the axon responds to stimulation through the dendrite and the soma. So the axon is not going to react to, to a neurotransmitter. Only the dendrites and the axon terminals are going to react to the uh, neurotransmitter. So no matter how much neurotransmitter is floating around, uh, outside the axon, it's not going to react. It can only react to, uh, to the, the uh, electrical charge. So you're not going to get one that, that uh, because there's too much neurotransmitter emitter around the axon, it's not going to short itself out. 
It, there's only two places where it can actually react. One is the dendrites, and the other is the axon terminal. And those are the only two places that react to chemicals. The, whole, the axon only reacts to the uh, depolarization. It only reacts to, to electrical charge. Neurons in the central nervous system are myelinated by oligodendrocytes, and neurons in the peripheral nervous system are myelin, myelinated by Schwann cells. The myelin covering the neuron does not allow potassium leakage from the area covered by the myelin, and that's, of course, why these cells are more rapid. Uh, they're sealed by the myelin, is sealing them, uh, so there, there is much less leakage taking place. As much fun as that is. I might. Okay. okay. The depolarization voltage is channeled down the, the axon from one node of Ranvier to the next, increasing the response by as much as 15 times. This form of conduction is known as uh, sal saltatory conduction. It's rapid conduction, and the reason is because since there is no leakage, the, the uh, electrical uh, stimulation can go much, much faster to, the, to the, the point of 15 times faster. So you would think we would be a lot smarter if we had uh, myelin, if the part that we thought with uh, was myelinated instead of uh, non-myelinated neurons. But they're not. The, our gray matter is gray matter. The reason it's gray is because it's non-myelinated. So our thought process is relatively slow. Kinda. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where due to a genetic flaw or, or environmental trigger, an individual's immune system destroys the myelin on the select neurons. This causes a slowing of motor movements and loss of sensory abilities due to the slowing of neuronal responses. As you can see, the, the myelin has been damaged, and the reason it's damaged is because of the mutation, multiple sclerosis. And of course, they just had an MS, I don't know, we, everybody gave money to the MS something or other. It used to be, uh, what's his name, what was his name? Jerry Lewis. He used to have the MS thing every Labor Day. March of Dimes? Well, no, it's not March of Dimes, it was, it was some of the, something that had to do with the MS. Of course, Jerry Lewis died last year, some other people have been taking it out. The firefighters get out and collect money. And it goes to MS research. That's how they figured, uh, figured out what was going on with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, atherolateral sclerosis. Anyway, this is uh, multiple sclerosis, and this can be a genetic problem. Also, it can have something to do with the environment. Also, it can have something to do with the uh, Wrap that you got that, that people put in their bodies from time to time, crystal meth, especially crystal meth. And really, I, know, I wasn't thinking monster, but I am now monster. No, it's not monster. Uh, some of the other horrible things, or some of the chemicals in the air, or the chemicals in the water, you know, around. You're, you're probably no, you're not. You're not okay here because you got uranium mines right on the other side of the mountains. And the, the chemicals that they use to, to get that uranium out of the, the rocks, that's not good stuff. Okay. So it potentially can contaminate people. Uh, remember they had that, uh, what was it? They had the, the break in, in one of those uranium holding tank things. And it uh, contaminated the river on the other side. And then people wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't graze their, their uh, cattle over there. Yeah, so they were buying, they're going up to Cortez to buy hay because their, their own grazing lands were contaminated. Yeah. These are the environmental things that we're talking about when we're talking about multiple sclerosis. And of course, everybody's different. Um, little kids are more sensitive to this stuff than adults are. I mean, our, our system is already, uh, is, is already mature. We don't have to worry about this stuff. But if we've got a kid and they, they go playing in that field where the water contaminated the grass, you know, potentially they could end up with multiple sclerosis. It could cause uh, some, some odd mutation to take place. And all of a sudden the kid's got MS. Back to the axon and the dendrites. 
so like a, is it like a sensory Are we talking about MS? Uh, no, the axon of the dendrites. Like let's say, for example, you get like a burn and that uh, negative charge is on the outside and the positive charge is inside. Mm -hmm. Now like, like it senses that, is that we're like, we're that equal level of negative 70 will hit positive 40? Now are we talking about a burn? Yeah. You're talking about somebody's burned themselves. Yeah, like a, like a burn, like a kind of an arm. Severe, severe yeah. burn? Not a severe burn, like a sunburn. Like a, yeah, like a sunburn. Okay, so what you've done or is... A, uh, a steam burn. Okay. Like real instant, but you just, you, ah, there's that burn. Yeah it, yeah, it burns, and it doesn't burn for very long. All of a sudden it goes away. Mm -hmm. And the reason it goes away is because you have uh, overstimulated those, those neurons. So now they can't be stimulated anymore, as exciting as that is. If right after it happened, you started scratching yourself up here on the shoulder, you burned your arm, you start scratching yourself on the shoulder, that pain would go away. Because your brain can only take in so it's a select amount of information. Mm -hmm. And so you created uh, a, a counter uh, irritant <laughs> to the burn. So now, since you're scratching yourself over here, all you're feeling is the scratching, which doesn't hurt, actually. But the burn, of course, would hurt. But you, you can't. You're not letting it get through. Um, is that like what would the maybe what amputees probably feel like when they're missing a limb and the, or you say like the phantom? It's, well, the phantom pain is in their brain. It's not actually in. There's no nothing down here. Those neurons are gone, but they're feeling their fingers. You know, they don't have fingers, but they're feeling them because their brain is telling them that portion of the brain is is lighting up. So that's why they're feeling phantom pain. Most synapses are triggered. Most synapses are triggered by chemical tr neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. But researchers have discovered that some synapses in the brain are stimulated by electrical electrical respons responses from another neuron. And of course, these are really really close together. If the electrical charge is actually jumping over the synaptic cleft, this is able to occur because the synaptic cleft of these neurons is one tenth the distance of a chem chemical synapse, as you can see. The two are almost touching one another. They can't touch each other or they short each other out, but uh, they are very, very close to one another. Not all neurons cause their connecting neuron to fire. Uh, some neurons are inhibitory neurons, and instead of raising the excitatory potential depolarizing the neuron, it lowers the excitatory potential, hyperpolarizes the neuron, making it more difficult for the neuron to fire. So we do have inhibitory Neuro, uh, neurons in our in our bodies. A uh, good example would be uh, if you go into a um, uh, a very loud concert. Uh, all of a sudden, your ears will react, and you think it's so loud that you're going to go deaf. Uh, your uh, inhibitory neurons in your ear will temper the uh, your ability to hear. So it will, it will. It's not that slow. It's actually relatively quick, but uh, it will allow you to be in that area without without going deaf. Uh, one of the problems with being in an explosion, and I hope none of you have ever been in an explosion, well, one of the problems with being in an explosion is that it's a loud noise, it's a lot of pressure all at one time. Uh, it's not like your, your, your ears can't protect themselves. I mean, it's just an, uh, an instantaneous thing. A thing, and a lot of times you lose your hearing for a period of time because of the shock of the of the explosion. Now you haven't really damaged your hearing, well sometimes you have, but uh, probably you haven't damaged your hearing, but if it were a continuous process, eventually what would happen would be, it would be the initial shock and then uh, you would get your hearing back very, relatively rapidly because it would be a continuous process, just like the music. Or just like being in a, a car that, with a really loud bass, you know, your ears the first time you hear it, it just about knocks your head off. And then eventually, of course, you get used to it. And the getting used to it is these inhibitory neurons that are, that are dampening your hearing, your ability to hear. Inhibition is done by inducing uh, channels uh, in the receiving neuron to open, allowing uh, more negative chloride ions into the neuron. Uh, since the chloride ions have a negative charge, they lower the neuron's potential to fire. 
An inhibitory or excitatory neuron is determined by the neurotransmitter that they produce. So some, some uh, neurotransmitters are inhibitory, some are uh, excitatory. Um, uh, serotonin, for example, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, the GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. All the glutamates are inhibitory neurotransmitters. So if they put off a glutamate or if they put off a serotonin or a melatonin, uh, then it is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And what it does is it allows more chloride in there, so the stimulation, it takes more stimulation to activate the neuron. Some neurons have hundreds of other neurons feeding into them. With these neurons, they may require a number of neuronal stimulations before uh, the threshold is reached. This accumulative effect uh, that is required by stimulation is known as special summation. In other words, there has to be lots and lots of of stimulation before uh, the neuron will actually fire. Let me see where I am. Why don't we stop right here and we'll pick this up next time since my watch is about to die, as exciting as that is.